Good morning. Welcome back to the Retirement Report. I'm Hank Parrott, your host. All right, been having, we've been talking a lot about the markets today and about uh, sharing with you a lot of different investment strategies. It's very important to understand these. And as I mentioned, how to get that asset allocation model right. I want to share a couple of things with you uh, with regard to this as well. As I was saying about um, being overly weighted in sectors, being overly weighted in large cap, which both have, you know, sort of like tech, for instance, has outperformed. But think of this, the S&P 500 index, okay, that's your large cap growth for the most part. All right, what we're looking at with large caps, the S&P 500 index over the last uh, 10, 11 years, actually, has performed at about 13% a year. So most anyone that's heavily weighted, and most everything I look at, they're all swaying into that. But as Dalbar has said, Dalbar is an independent research group for um, in measuring basically how individual investors do relative to the market. And most investors underperform the market, and one reason is they're chasing past performance. Oh, look how well that did. I'll go do that. Well, then what happens? It underperforms. So an example would be, as I mentioned, the S&P over the last 11 years, you've got a return of about 13% a year. That's pretty phenomenal. However, if we look over the last 20 years, we see the S&P actually only did about 6% a year. Whoa, what happened? Less than half. That gives you an idea of what I'm talking about, of reverting to a mean. So if we've had this kind of a run, what would we expect? over the next 10 years, right? It's gonna to revert to that mean most likely. So this is one of the things in where are you positioned today? Are you uh, positioning your asset allocation model? Is it based on the last 10 years or what we anticipate for the next 10? We don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what's gonna happen for sure. For the market, to for the S&P to go another 10 years doing that, that would be historical. That's never happened. Here's something else to keep in mind, and we're going to jump because we on the sector piece, uh, Jeremy, I want you to talk about that, but uh, I want to share something about this 2%. As Jeremy mentioned earlier, when we look at the equal weight index since 1926, outperformed the market weight index by about 200 basis points. In other words, 2% a year. Now, you may be thinking, well, 2% a year, is that that significant? Well, here's an example of that. Seeking Alpha report showed that $1 invested in a market cap weighted, in other words, the S&P, since 1926, or in 1926, would have grown to $8,096 at the end of 2017. Now, think of this. That same dollar invested in that equal weighted index over the same period would have grown to 24449 So that 2% a year means three times as much money over that lengthy a period, of course, right? But that means that's how significant it would be. When I run numbers and we look over your, in your retirement years over the next you know, 20, 30 years even, and we see it's a, a tremendous difference, very significant difference that that 2% a year can make with how much money you're going to have. And Jeremy, the sector piece is another part of that uh, that we were talking about. And you mentioned, I think, about tech. Why don't you share about tech and I think it was communications was the other sector. Yeah, you're, you're right, Hank. So if you look at the market weight, uh, just two sectors make up about 35%. That's technology uh, and uh, communication uh, versus about 16% in the equal weight. So big difference in there. And again, if those sectors are performing well, it's going to bode well for, for your returns. And if they're not, it's going to be the opposite. And so I guess the, the message that, that I would uh, share in relation to that is, you know, are you rebalancing? Uh, whether you use an equal weight, equal weight does it on its own, but market weight, are you rebalancing uh, your portfolio, right? Because otherwise you could see a much larger portion of your portfolio in large cap. Uh, as Hank shared, you know, over the last 11 years has performed extremely well, but you look at large cap this year through last week is down about 1%. You look at small cap, it was up about 25% year to date. So it's not that you should sell all your large cap, but we see it all the time. Do you have any exposure to small cap? Should you consider doing that? Do you have large exposure to large cap, right? That, that's the things to look at is, is that asset allocation. Do I need to review that? Am I top heavy in some areas that I need to sell some of that and some areas that I'm underweighted in, uh, reinvested into? So again, diversify using things like uh, equal weight uh, that we're big believers in and and there's many ways to do it Hank you're, you're uh, incorporating it into many of your portfolios not mm -hmm. exclusively but in conjunction with market weight okay. and we have some standalone strategies 
that our stop loss strategies is, is Hank talked about, and there's three versions. There's a equal weight, there is a market weight, and there's QQQ. And within there, there's a conservative, moderate, and aggressive strategy to choose from. Uh, so a lot of ways to incorporate them together uh, or separately, but but many times together. And this is one of the things. It's the blending. If you think in terms of asset allocation, what we're talking about is not that you should do one thing over another thing. It's how do I incorporate all the tools in the kit? Right? Um, what was that about if, if, if the only uh, tool I have in my tool belt is a hammer, all of a sudden everything looks like a nail, okay? I'm going to be just looking, how do I use this? How do I use this? The more tools you have, the better you're going to be able to do the job. And this goes with investing even more so. If, if all I had is the S&P 500, that's going to perform, outperform most active money managers, as we said. Okay, over the long term, all of them, really, when you get right down to it. However, what's the problem? The volatility. So if I can blend in, say, some small caps with that large cap, I can reduce down my risk while still getting that market return over the long term. What else can I put in there? And we've talked about maybe I need international and U.S. The last 10 years, again, international emerging markets have not done nearly as well as the U.S. portfolios have done. However, what's it going to be over the next 10 years? Might that change? We have to be looking forward, not always just looking back. Okay, in particular when it comes to how we do our asset allocation model. There's a chart in my office that shows different asset categories, and I think I've shown it on, in fact, I know I've shown it on here many times as well. And basically it shows how asset categories over different periods, when you look at them and they're all color-coded, there's no pattern here. There's no way of knowing whether it's going to be large caps that perform in a, in a particular period or outperform in a particular period or small caps or international or emerging markets or even cash sometimes. Sometimes money markets did better than, than being in the market in certain bear markets, right? So you have to have a blending of these. Now, it's not just that to haphazardly do it, right? We have, we have 60, or excuse me, 50 years of Nobel Prize winning academic research showing us how to construct portfolios. And, these, and this research is always being improved upon. So, Jeremy, as you were talking about, with uh, and, and uh, last week when we had Phil Kamala on, there's an example of some of the new re uh, that he spoke to about some of the new research, some of the new things available out there, the new tools like this Equal Weight Index as an example that we can utilize to better serve our clients, better uh, help people in terms of getting a better result with our investing. Extra on this sectors, by the way, for you to you know on that end. Heavily weighted right now in sectors, if you're in an S&P, I'm thinking the S&P over the next 10 years is going to underperform other asset categories. Doesn't mean we're going to get rid of it. It means, though, in terms of proportion, we're going to be aware of that. We're going to be a little more defensive. We're going to be thinking in terms of the potential of a bear market being greater, say, two, three years from now uh, going out. I think in the next year, less likely, but beyond that, I, I would be concerned. Yeah, I think that I think one of the big takeaways is, you know, review your portfolio. If you're do it yourself first, certainly review your portfolio. Or do you have a heavy weighting in certain areas? Do you need to look at international uh, emerging markets, uh, small cap, equal weight, right? There's so many different things. You've got low interest rates, you've got, you know, the silent tax and, and inflation, you've got the crazy year that we saw, the, the fastest decline, 30% decline in the history of the stock market, fastest uh, bear market recovery. Times are a changing, right? You, you've should certainly look at your portfolio and see if there's changes that need to be made. And as we say uh, all the time, you know, have you gotten a second opinion on your plan? Do you have an income plan, an estate plan, you know, a tax plan? Are you factoring in inflation? Are you f factoring in taxes? Are, you know, how are you invested? Is Are you taking on more risk, as T uh, Hank talked about earlier, than, than you need for the return, right? All those things are very valid. We're in very unique times. Um, well, and, you know, Jeremy, to your, your stop loss strategy, Strategy. This is one of those areas I looked at and I've looked in, at some of the back testing that was done with stop loss and looked at uh, how it performed over the last 10 years and then over the last 20 years. And there are periods where this stop loss piece would be a, would outperform a buy and hold strategy. 
Now, let's talk a little bit about this stop loss. We 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 spent some time and a couple a couple of weeks ago, I think it was on the show, getting into that. But it, it's a good one to revisit as well. So a stop loss, you, you typically see an investor maybe buy a stock as an example and put in a stop loss order. What they're saying is, if it drops, I'm buying this stock thinking it's going to go up. But if it goes down, I want to cut my losses. I want to stop that loss at a particular percentage, whether that's 5%, 10%, whatever you're pegging it. You're saying if it drops, I'm thinking it's going up, but if it drops below this, I made a mistake, get me out. And guess what? Most investors make those kind of mistakes all the time. It's, it's very common. They put stop loss orders because they typically guess wrong more than they guess right and they want to limit their losses. And the same thing, on the gain side, they may want to take some profits off as, they, as they're going up as well, just to protect on that downside further. Stop loss in this situation, think of it this way. I'm, maybe if, if, if it, in periods where it's gonna outperform, great. But even in periods where it underperforms, it's not that significant, maybe 1% or something is that and some might feel and i know i've talked to some of my clients when in approaching them about the stop loss piece they like, you know what if i it's like at paying insurance to limit how much i might lose in a stock market uh bear in the next bear market many find that to be worthwhile jeremy i don't know how you use it in terms of well i do know because we've talked about it a little bit but in these different portfolios this is another great tool that can be used for a little more peace of mind when it comes to investing yeah, so some of the benefits of the potential benefits of a stop loss uh, or our stop loss strategies that, that we see is, is um, it's mechanical. Meaning, you know, it's going to happen. It's what it's going to do on the sell trigger to get out of equities or the buyback, which is much more difficult. When do you mm -hmm. buy back into the market? Those things are preset, predetermined, and they're mechanical. So it takes the emotion out of investing. Do I sell at 10%? Do I sell at 12%? Uh, you know, those types of things. And when you look at the mechanics of the S&P, I'm sorry, of, of our stop loss strategies, we looked back for many, many, many years, you know, 70 years, and what we found is that when the S&P 500 declines by 12% or greater, that there's a much higher probability of a further decline. That's why we set our stop loss, whether it's market weight, equal weight, or QQQ, if the S&P 500 closes down 12% or greater, we are going to sell out of equities. So that is preset. And then we have a preset buyback. There's two different versions uh, of the buyback. It just depends on how far the S&P 500 goes down. And why is that? Because based on history, our second trigger, if the S&P from the top to the bottom is down 30% or greater, and then we have a faster okay. buyback, Hank, because hist yeah. historically speaking, when that happens... Well, that's what we want. This yeah. is about statistical probability. There is no guarantee. There is no set thing that happens 100% of the time, but research can help us determine what's going to happen most of the time and how to position ourselves to benefit from that. And then we'll talk when we come back from the break here about some hedging strategies for those other times. But first to break, join us here. We'll be right back on The Retirement Report.